Gentlemen, uh, yesterday, and in fact, I talked with Kagan uh, earlier in the week, and, and I had gotten word that uh, but some, some local people were going to be making a trip over to the Carolinas for the uh, relief to the, uh, the hurricane that uh, has crashed into the, to the east coast over there. And immediately in my spirit, I, I, I just, the Lord said, hey, I was there for you. Now you, you need to be there for them. And so, um, and, and let me tell you something. This is, this is how God works. Just the day before, uh, I got a call, or I got a text, actually. Uh, my wife texts me and says, hey, um, uh, we have the ability to get some hygiene kits. Do you want them? And they were prepackaged, and, and, you know, it had soap and deodorant and toothpaste and things like that in there, and it was already prepackaged. And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I'm like, uh, Kagan and Mike run Salt and Light, the outreach ministry here at the church. And, and so we've dedicated two rooms to that ministry. One of them is primarily for food and diapers and things like that that people need. And then the, uh, the other room is dedicated for clothing. And we had plenty of clothing. And, and I think some of the supplies might have been running a little bit low. But I said, yeah, I'll go get it. And they were like, well, how many do you want? I said, I don't know. I'll just, whatever my truck will hold. So I got over there, and they loaded up an entire pallet with a forklift in the bed of my truck. And I said, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. So I came up here, and then just that next day or that evening, I had saw a post on Facebook that said that somebody here locally knew of somebody that was going to be making a trip over to the Carolinas, and uh, they were going to be getting in touch with uh, some ministries over there that were uh, like we are, and, you know, those, everyone here probably already knows we were a distribution center last year for Harvey. And it was, a tremendous, <clears throat> it was a tremendous blessing to be able to do that. I mean, yes, it was hard, and there's no doubt about it. It was very physically demanding on, on every person that was here that was involved with it. We worked most of the time anywhere from probably 10 to 16-hour days every day, making sure that the supplies that people needed were here and were available for them to come as they needed. And um, so I contacted Kay and I said, hey, we need to get some stuff together out of our rooms and, and we're gonna, I'm going to link up with this guy and we're going we're gonna to send as much as we can. And uh, then when I was up here yesterday, uh, waiting on them to get here to load everything up. And I, I don't even remember how many. Uh, I put more stuff out there, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I went rummage around in your room in there, and I, I put more stuff in there. So I, I don't even know how many boxes of stuff we sent. Uh, 20, 30 boxes of stuff loaded. I'm talking packed down diapers and, and um, you know, these essentials that, that they're going to need. Uh, right off the bat, the immediate needs. Uh, toothbrushes, um, things of that nature. While I was waiting for them up here, I was supposed to meet them about 9 o'clock. And they, they called me and says, hey, we just had a blowout on our trailer. I was like, okay. Uh, do you want me to load everything up that I've got and bring it to you? He said, well, we're real close. You know, I'm just going to change this flat. Well, that turned into about a, a three-and-a-half-hour wait because... All of the tires were bad on the trailer. And so I told Tina, I, had, I called Tina uh, at the house, and I says, uh, I says, hey, look, I says, I'm not going to be home real quick. I says, I'm waiting on, on them to get here. And I said, really and truly, I'm kind of glad it happened on the way here than at like 2 o'clock in the morning going down I-10 or something, you know. So they ended up having to replace all the tires on a tandem axle trailer and and even purchased extra tires for backup, okay? And so they got, in, in this amount of time, I'm like, I'm sitting up here and I'm, I'm twiddling my thumbs and I clean my office a little bit. I know it doesn't look like, if you've ever been in my office, it doesn't look like I cleaned my office, but I cleaned it up a little bit. Then I went and I cleaned all the stuff that was in the hallway up from all the painting and, and remodeling that we did and put it in the back room and, I was like, well, what else can I do here, you know? And I'm, I'm just twiddling my thumbs, wasting time. And Tina uh, Stelly came in to do some work in the office, and she says, hey, what about all the medical supplies? And, I, and I'm thinking, I, I didn't think we had any. 
but we had a bunch of medical supplies that we've kept from the last storm. And I'm talking already boxed up. I don't even know how many thousands of dollars worth of medical supplies that were donated to us. And so I sent every bit of it. I mean, we kept a handful of stuff for essential needs, but, I mean, it was a blessing for us to be able to do that. Uh, to be able to, you know, and I, and I told Andrea, I think Andrea was at work yesterday, and I said, I said, what do you want me to keep? And she was busy at work. She really couldn't respond. And, and I just said, you know what? I'm sending it all. God gave it to us. If we need it again, he's going to give it again. And so it was a blessing. And I don't have the picture to put up here. But when he got here, he had a 30-foot tandem axle trailer that was pretty darn close to full. And he still had more stuff to go get. Um, so y'all be praying for their trip. Uh, they attend there. It, that's um, the spells over at Pathway. Yeah, William. Uh, Y'all be praying for them. They're going to be leaving out, I think, around three or four o'clock this afternoon. He said, and so y'all be praying for safe travel for them. That God is going to get them to where they need to go. They, he told me they've got several ministries uh, already uh, lined up for them to go and to give stuff to, so that they can get it to the people that need it the most and so uh, y'all be praying for that and uh, one of the other things I told Tina to put in the bulletin uh, another thing was it was a blessing for us to be able to help some of our local ministries they're not a, they're not a part of this ministry but they are here in the community and through our hurricane relief uh, link that is on our mobile app if you're if you're a mobile giver there's a link on there and it's it states hurricane relief and so I told her, I said, you know, we were able to help many ministries that are here locally that are, that are not financially sound here in our community. We were able to help them over this past year. And so we want to do the same thing going that way because a lot of the people that reached out to me were from all over the country that, that just called me and says, hey, we, we, we want to help. We don't have a way to drive stuff to you. How can we help? And so we set up that link on our mobile site, says Hurricane Relief. I said, just give to that, and, and we'll get it distributed, you know, in a, in, a, in a manner that's pleasing to God. And so that's what we did. And so I want that message to get out there to, to anyone that is listening, that we, we still have that link there. It is still there, and it's still functional. And so uh, if you or if, if somebody you know says, hey, how can we help, direct them in that way. And then here in about a month or so, we'll get in contact with a ministry over there, and we'll, we'll direct the funds that way. So if that's something that, that you're maybe praying about, about doing, you know, I think we need to stick together as a nation. Amen? When we were, when we were hurting in probably the most hurt we've ever seen in our lifetimes, our country reached out to us when we were in need. And so now it's our turn to be a part of reaching out to other people. Amen. Well, that ain't my message, and I didn't intend to say that, and I don't have that in my notes, but that was free information. I won't charge you for it. I want to welcome all the visitors here today. If this is your first time visiting at New Covenant, we welcome you. Um, we ask that you fill out a visitor's card. If you've never been here before, fill out a visitor's card and place it in the offering boxes hanging on the back wall. We do not take up a, a collection. We don't. Uh, pass around a plate or anything like that your tithes and offerings are between you and the Lord and so that's where that would go put that little visitor's card in that box and we would love to reach out to you I promise I won't pester you on the phone I'm not going to call you every day and make sure you know things are going right I'm not going to text you every five minutes but I might reach out to you who knows I want a question I mean I, I, I want to ask you a question do you believe Before I ask that question, do you really even know what believing means? A lot of times in church circles, you hear the word faith. You hear about the word faith. Do you have faith? You got to have faith. You got to have faith. The faith of a grain of a mustard seed. You walk in faith. We're saved by faith. We're saved by grace. Right? But this word believe, it has a different meaning. A lot of times when you hear a message speaking about faith, 
you hear messages out of Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. All you got to do is read through Hebrews chapter 11, and it'll inspire you about what God has done through ordinary people. The things that he did through Abraham, the things that he did through Sarah, the things that he's done through all of the prophets, all of the people, the men and the women of God, and even children of God. The things that he's done on a continual basis, all throughout life, all throughout history. It, 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 is, it is inspiring when you read about ordinary people like me. I am an ordinary person. There's nothing extraordinary or extraordinary about me except that I am a child of the Most High God. I belong to Him. According to Romans chapter 8, and I was sharing this in my office this morning, in Romans chapter 8, he says that we are adopted into the family of God. Amen? And so it, it brings me joy to know the fact that my daddy loves me. And my daddy has done so much for me. I don't know if you look at it that way or not, but that's how I look at it. It's personal to me. That's how personal the gospel is to me. That's how personal my relationship is with my heavenly father. I just call him daddy. I say, daddy, I am hurting right now and I need you in my life. Daddy, I, I'm going through something and I need some advice. My children, my grown children have done that before. Call me up on the phone. Daddy, I need some information or I need some advice. How would you do this? How would you do that? And I respond as a loving father. Sometimes it may not be what they want to hear, but I still give that loving advice. Well, our Heavenly Father is no different. He loves us. He cares about what we're going through. He cares about the things in our life. And when we cry out to Him, when we ask Him, Daddy, I need help in this situation, sometimes we don't like the way He gives it to us, do we? Sometimes it's okay. You can do like this. This means yes in Texas, and this means no in Texas. Okay? Participation is way better. When, when we participate, it drives me. It gets me charged up, and I go through my notes a whole lot faster, and then you get to Luby's a whole lot quicker. Do you believe? Turn to Luke chapter 1. I, I didn't plan to do it this way. Actually, I was going to go to Scripture a whole lot later in the, in the message, but I feel like I, I, need, to, I need to go ahead and, and, and look at the Scripture. In Luke chapter 1... While you're turning there, I'm going to begin reading at verse 11. But I want to kind of tell you where we're at. In Luke chapter 1, this is about Zechariah and Elizabeth. If you don't know who Zechariah and Elizabeth is, Zechariah was a priest in the temple, and Elizabeth was his wife. Zechariah and Elizabeth were the parents of John the Baptist. Okay? Zechariah and Elizabeth, like Abraham and Sarah were old and beyond childbearing days. So we find Zechariah beginning in verse 11 in the temple. He's fulfilling his priestly duty. He's working in the temple like he's supposed to do. It says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. Now, we've heard that before, haven't we? We've heard that same statement in Scripture before, where God, where God sent an angel, and he, he went and he told Mary, you're going to be with child. You're going you're to give birth to the Savior of the world. We also know in Scripture where, where God had sent an angel and talked to to Abraham and said, you're going to be the father of many nations. Even though you're almost a hundred years old and your wife has a barren uh, a body and you can't hold a child anymore, you're going to be the father of many nations and a child is going to come through you. We've heard this before. But he says, your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. Now, that'll come in a little bit later because that right there in itself, that one statement is controversy. I say controversy because it goes against their heritage. It goes against what they believe. I'll, I'll point that out in a moment. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. 
He must never touch wine or alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth and will turn many Israelites to the Lord God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. See, he was just basically telling him what his ministry was going to be. The word says that he is to be the forerunner of Christ, right? He's to kind of like lay the road. He's, he's, he's laying the asphalt to the roadway so that the people can travel and come to Christ. He's laying the information out before them is what his job is supposed to do. And it says that he is going to do this through the power and the anointing that was on Elijah. That tells me that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was active in the, in the Old Testament. And this is, listen to me, this is before Jesus was born. Do you remember, and the guys that have been here on Wednesday night have been listening to my messages on Wednesday night about the Holy Spirit. You, then you know that Jesus said, I've got to leave this place so that the Holy Spirit can come and can work in the earth, right? This is before all that happened. But the Scripture is saying that John is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit through the same power that Elijah had to fulfill the priestly roles in the temple. Amen? And so, I mean, he's just saying, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? This is where we're at right now. Do you believe? The priest of God was in the temple doing the work at the temple. He was supposed to be a man of God. How many people today that are in the church today, that are in this building today, are watching us on the live feed? How many people would be willing to say, you know what, I prayed for a long, long time asking God to do something in my life, to reveal to me something in my life, or to move in my life, but when the answer came, I didn't believe it because it didn't come in the form that I thought it would come in. I mean, can we really be honest today? I've done that before. You see, I had it planned out. I said, God, this is how, this is how I think it should be. <laughs> how many people have done that? God, this is how it should be. But it came in God's perfect wisdom. It came in God's understanding. And we didn't want to accept it because it didn't come in the package that we thought it should be packaged in. It's okay. I'll be honest. I'm okay with it. I've done that. I've done that. Think like I've got more wisdom than God. He said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God and he'll give you wisdom. I know he's got way more than I've got. Look what he says here. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. Oh, well, let me back it up. First of all, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure that this will happen? I'm an old man now. And my wife is also well along in her years. <laughs> I, I could just see the, maybe the frustration. He says here, the, the angel says, I am Gabriel. It might have been more like, I am Gabriel. Are y'all awake yet? I'm sure it was probably loud. I mean, he didn't go up to him and say, I'm Gabriel. Listen to what I've got to say. I think it was powerful. I think he spoke in power. That's the same power that comes from the throne of God. He said, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the very presence of God, and it was Him, God, that sent me to bring you this good news. That's what I'm talking about today. Do you believe? When God gives you a word, do you really believe that it's from God? Do you really trust God to do what He said He would do? That's what I'm asking you today. That's something that you need to be asking yourself right now. Do I really trust God with my life? Because we see an entire nation, we see a world today that does not fully trust God with their life. God, I, I, would, I would feel more comfortable if you would allow me to have control over what I do every day. I feel a little bit better about my abilities 
than, than if I would just sell out to you. Do you believe? When God said that He'll supply all of your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus, do you really believe that? Or do you believe that the company that you work for would be better off providing what you need? This is something I'm asking you to ask yourself. You don't have to respond to me, but I'm telling you right now that I have asked these questions before. I'm going to share that a little bit later. But what is faith? Let me just give you the definition of faith. The, the definition according to, I think it's Bible, Bible.org or something like that, one of, one of those uh, websites, it is complete trust or confidence. That's what faith is, complete trust or confidence. In other words, I added my own definition to it. It's believing in something that you can't see or touch as if you could. That's what faith is, right? But I think the simpler question is the title of my message today. Do you believe? Do you believe? What does it mean to believe? It means to accept something as true. It's very simple. To accept something as true, even without proof. It takes a lot of faith or a lot of belief to believe or to accept something as true even if I don't see it or can feel it very simple you probably heard preachers say this before the wind talks about the wind you can't see the wind blowing but you can see the effects of it right you can't see the wind but you can see it blow the trees you can see it moving the grass around that's the effects of it it's proof that it's there but I can't see it how do I know for sure because in my First grade class, the teacher said the wind is going to blow the tree. And so we've believed it all through life. I think a lot of times as I think a lot of times as leaders in the church, preachers, teachers, whatever it is, especially in today's society, the teaching of the word of God has gotten so watered down that it's hard for people to believe. It, it, it has become such a, such a feel-good society, such a feel-good message, that the teaching of conviction about, about what the Holy Spirit will do and what His role is in the church today has gotten so watered down and left out of the preaching and teaching of the Word of God that people have lost their real convictions in life. When we pray and we speak something totally different. That's what, that's what I'm talking about here. Do you believe? Look at again in Luke chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, Zechariah, the angel of the Lord, uh, Zechariah said to the angel of the Lord, how can, it, how can I be sure that it will happen? Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for a child. But when the angel of the Lord came and said, you're going to have a child, they didn't believe it. Or he didn't believe it. Didn't say anything about Elizabeth. But Zachariah is the man. He's the leader of the home. He's the spiritual leader. He's the guide. That's a question I want you to ask yourself today. How many, how many times have I asked God to do something, but I don't believe it when I do get the answer? Because it's not like I want it to be. When people ask, do you have faith? Do you believe? People, a lot of times, they say, well, yeah, I believe, I believe Jesus. I, I believe Jesus died for me. Yes? I'll answer yes to that. If somebody asks you right now, do, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? You might say, yes, yes, I, I do, I do, I do believe, I believe. Does, did Jesus die on the cross for your sins? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I believe that. Will Jesus heal you? Well, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, if He wants to, that's when it starts getting shady, doesn't it? When we get, when we get beyond the basic and we start getting to the real spirituality of a walk with Christ. 
Well, God set you free from addiction. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, if he wants me to not be addicted, yeah, I guess he will. I guess he'll set me free. That, this is how people think a lot of times. I'm not saying everybody here does. I'm not saying anybody here does. I'm just saying, according to the amount of people that I talk to on a daily or a weekly basis, these are the types of responses that I hear. Do you believe that God will set you free from this addiction that's in your life that is controlling your life? Well, I guess so. I mean, I think He will. But see, the Gospel is way more personal than that. There's not a think so, a maybe so. When God said so, it is so. We don't have to question. We don't have to say, well, I think, I mean, I, mean, I, th I know God loves me, but, you know, if He wants to, He can. Do you believe? Can God heal you? Maybe you're struggling with something in your life. Maybe, you've, maybe there's some sort of a sickness in your body. Maybe there's a sickness in you spiritually. Can God heal you? The response that I hear a lot of times is, I don't know. Because the message has been so watered down that people don't have confidence in the full gospel of the Word of God. People don't have full confidence in the fact that He already has healed you. Not just spiritually, but physically. And He is waiting on you. He's waiting on me to respond to what He has already spoken. Is this, is this, is this even remotely ministering to anybody here today? Because a lot of times in life, a lot of times in life we go through life with struggles. And I've told you this, and I'm big about this. I preach this all the time about how we struggle through life every day. Uh, and, and I mean, every day doesn't have to be a struggle. I'm not saying that every day has to be a struggle. But what I'm saying is, is that we all go through things in our life. And how many people just throw in the towel every single day saying, well, I thought God loved me, but His, His Word says that He does love you. But do you believe it? Do you really believe what the Word says about you? You know, I'm, I'm reminded. I'm reminded of when I was early in my walk. I was early... I was early, I was a young person, not only in age, but I was also, and I'm still young anyway, by the way. I may be a papa, but I'm a young papa, and I'm a handsome papa, and I'm fly looking. I've said that many times, I'm fly looking. But that's not my message today. Do you believe what the Word says about you? I remember early in my walk, I wasn't really struggling with I wasn't really struggling with does God love me or anything like that but but I was saying God show yourself to me reveal yourself to me I mean if you really do love me because this is how we think right God if you really see how many kids do that to their parents if you love me you'll let me go to the dance I mean if you really love me you'll buy me this whatever Xbox a what who is that? And so I was at this wall in this place in my walk, and I said, God, do you can you just show yourself to me? Can you just manifest yourself to me? And I mean, isn't that what, what Moses wanted? I mean, when Moses was walking with God, he said he just pestered God over and over and said, God, would you just show yourself? I want to see your face, God. I want to see your power. I want to see who you are. I'm following you, and I'm stepping out in faith. I'm believing what your word says. See, he didn't have awesome scriptures like, like in Galatians or James or, or in Colossians, you know, where it could just, the, the testing of your faith that he talks about in chapter, James chapter 1 when he says it's the, the trying of your faith that produces patience. He didn't have those kind of awesome scriptures to, to stand on. He just said, God, I'm trusting you, and all these people over here want to kill me because I'm doing what you said. I just want to see your face. I just want to see a manifestation of your presence. What is the word manifestation? Does anybody know? The guys that were in my Wednesday night class better know the answer to this question. What is a manifestation? It's proof. It's evidence. It's a testimony. That's what a manifestation is. See, how many times have you ever, if you would be honest, would you say, 
Well, I think like a manifestation would be like this, this great powerful event that takes place. I mean, when, when you say God manifest, and you probably hear me say this from the pulpit all the time, God manifest your presence in this building. Give a testimony of your presence in this building. He says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He says if any two of you will agree, are, are there two people, or there, is there just one person in this building today that is willing to stand in agreement with me today and say, I believe what the Word of God says. What you're talking about, preacher, is the absolute truth. God does love me. God does care about my every day. God does care about the trials, the tribulations, the struggles that I go through every day. God does care. But you see, we want to get mad at God because sometimes God's got to back up and say, I've been trying. I've been trying to help you. I've been trying to, to guide your life. But you don't want to listen to what I've got to say. You don't even want to accept the answer that I'm giving you. So I'm just going to have to back up and I'm just going to have to let you go through what you're going through so that you can see that I am a loving and a forgiving God. Sometimes it takes that. I could give you instance after instance in my own personal life where God has just had to back up and let me fall flat on my face so that I could look up and say, God, I need you. I could stand here all day giving you testimony after testimony in my own personal life where God has reached His hand out and says, have you learned anything yet? Back to my story, I, I remember when I was young in my, in my walk with the Lord, and I was saying, God, I just, I just need you to reveal yourself to me. I just need, you, I need to know that you really do love me. And I share this in my testimony. I share this, this, this story in my testimony. It's real life. And my wife is not in here today. She's in the back with the kids, but she could testify to this story how when... We hadn't been living in our home very long, the one that we live in now. And we had a gas leak. Natural things, I mean, it smelled like rotten eggs. I mean, it stunk. You walk in, man, did you forget to take the trash out? I thought it was your turn to take the trash out. No, it's your job. I work all day. Why can't you take the trash out? You know, you get into an argument. It's okay. It happens. Go over to the garbage can. It's got a clean bag in it. What does that smell? Open up the windows. Open up the doors. Let the, let the cool southeast Texas breeze blow through. <laughs> Long story short, after multiple calls to the gas company to come out and to check, they, you know, they do whatever they do. Uh, they shut off the meter whatever i don't know what all they do to check no man you ain't got a leak you're good you're good you're okay i've got three small kids at that time little bitty kids at that time just something wasn't right days went by in fact i would even say probably a few weeks went by still got this smell horrible smell gas bill shows up ungodly gas bill I'm like something ain't right here so I climb up in the attic myself and I've told I've, I've, most of you have heard this testimony there was a hole so big in the gas line that was feeding our furnace which this was in the winter by the way so our furnace was running a lot I could stick my finger in the hole I've never been so scared in my life I was scared to turn the knob off. But I reached over and I closed the knob off. And I got out of the attic as quick as I could. And I got the kids out. I wasn't asking God to reveal Himself to me that day. But after all that was said and done, and I put a new line in, I fixed it, Contrary to what GSU said, or is it GSU? Or the, I don't know what they were called back then. It, it, it wasn't Texas Gas. But I, that's it, Southern Union. I sat down in my chair. It 
And God said, you've been wanting me to show myself to you. And he gave me a vision of his hand on top of my house. And he said, this is why you're not dead. I'm telling you, it was just as I'm looking at you right now, that's how real the vision was. His hand was sitting on top of our house and he said, this is why you're not dead. Because I love you. There was enough gas that had been leaked into my house over the weeks that I probably, if my house would have exploded, it would have taken the entire block out. You've seen that on the news here recently, up somewhere up north, where multiple houses exploded because of a gas leak. I could have taken out the entire block. But God showed me that manifestation that I was asking for. God, reveal yourself to me so that I can really believe. This was before I had surrendered to the ministry. This was when I was a baby in Christ, when I was just, I was spending a lot of time devoting to study and the reading of His Word just to learn who I was and who He was. And I was saying, and I had come across those instances where Moses was pestering God, wanting to see His face, and I started doing the same thing. I started pestering God until He revealed His power. There is no explanation. Back in them days, we didn't have cell phones. We still had phones hanging on the wall. Y'all remember them? About half of us in this room could remember those days when we had a phone hanging on the wall and it had a 47-foot cord. <laughs> but do you believe? That's the question here today. Do you believe? I could, I, could re, I could reveal all sorts of awesome testimony in my life where God has so powerfully shown His self. I remember when we first started tithing. We, we were in this building and it looked way different than it does now. There were white... No, I think back then there were paneling walls and there was a strip of carpet down the center aisle and everything else was tile on each side and there was these old funky, nasty blue chairs that were very uncomfortable. But God was moving. And I was battling with becoming a giver. I was struggling with it because I wanted to spend my hard-earned money on something way more productive, like getting drunk or getting high or something along those lines. But God grabbed a hold of me. And He grabbed a hold of my wife. And at that moment, we dedicated ourselves to be a giver, to give to the Lord. And we did. We committed. We came up here, and I've told you all this story before. We, I laid my wallet. She laid the checkbook at the altar. It didn't look like this. It was, it was a, a much smaller one. And we laid it there, and we said, God, we trust you with everything. That, that was a picture for me to say, God, I don't, I don't have my wallet with me now, but I, I laid it down, and I said, God, you're in control of that thing. And so with that control came wisdom and it came discipline. I had to discipline myself. Not, it, not just in the fact that I was giving a certain dollar amount to the ministry or to the Lord, but the fact that I also had to apply that in my life when I left this building. I can't just go out and just live frivolously and waste my money on things that would just fulfill my flesh. But I had to say, God, is this going to honor you? So it's, it's, it's a part of a process that takes place. But as soon as I did that, that, would be, that was on a Sunday, probably like a Monday or a Tuesday, we didn't have enough money to pay our car note. A wife, three kids, house note, making $7 an hour, working 70 and 80 plus hours a week just to make ends meet, but we couldn't even pay our car note. We had a house note. It was $382 a month. I wish I could go back to those days. Glory to God. I've made a lot of dumb decisions in my life, and I have, to, I have the responsibility to, to go through those decisions. But God honors what we do because we're obedient to do it. And so anyway, I, I, we did that. We said, God, we trust you. And just a couple of days later, we couldn't pay our car note because we gave to the Lord. And 
I don't know if y'all, y'all remember the days of beepers? <laughs> we didn't have cell phones. I had a beeper. <laughs> so my wife would just send a little numerical code, you know, 911, hurry up, call, you know, or, you know, there'd be like a, a certain number, call whenever you get a chance, you know, whatever. And uh, I drove a garbage truck. I don't know if y'all knew that about me, but I was a, I was a sanitation engineer. laugh I mean I could take home anything I wanted (laughs) there were perks but she had sent this message you know she got a message to me somehow and um, so I I pull off and she says you're not going to believe this and I'm freaking out I mean I've got small kids at home I'm, I'm like you know, did Amber hurt the boys? Or did they have her pinned in the closet or something? I mean, I'm like, what ha- what's wrong? What happened? And she said, our car note is paid. I said, what? What are you talking about? Let me tell you something. This is where, these are instances like this in my life where my faith just grew astronomically. Because there were only three people that knew that we could not pay our car note. That was me, my wife, and God. No one else knew about it. I was very prideful in those days. And I would rebuke my wife if she told our business to someone else. Me, her, and God knew that we couldn't make it. But God showed me instantaneously. She told me the story. She said a person walked up to our door and handed me a card and said, God loves you, and walked away. And she, she looked out the window and just watched this guy disappear. Why am I telling you this? I'm asking you if you believe. You don't have to believe my story. I've lived it. I know it's true. I don't have to question it. But what about in your life? Because I needed almost $400 to pay that car note at that time. And there were four crisp, brand new $100 bills in that card. Instantaneously, God reminded me when He says, you ask for a manifestation of my presence. And He showed me the picture as if I was living it again of when I walked down that aisle and laid my wallet on that altar and said, God, you take control. Because I can't do it. I don't have the ability to control these finances. God, you've got to do it. And it was at that moment that I became a true tither and a giver into what God was doing. Because God showed Himself strong in my life. And there is no way that I would ever go back. Do you believe? I'm only on page two. How much time we got? Man, it's great. It's awesome. It's only 10 o'clock in California. So the real question here is, do you believe? Let me just make it a little bit clearer. Do you accept it as true? Not my my testimony. Isn't that what manifestation is? A testimony is a manifestation of what God has done. Don't accept my testimony. What about in your life? Do you believe what God has done in your life or what God will do in your life if you will trust Him? If you are 90 years old and you're 99, I don't know, Frenchie, have you been praying for a baby? I'm not sure. I don't know. But I know God can do it. I'm just saying. That's what happened in Abraham and Sarah's life. It's what, and here's the funny thing. You, if you've ever read the story, Sarah laughed. Ha, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. I see him every night. There ain't no way. 
Viagra ain't been invented yet. Hey, I'm just saying. This is a PG-13 show. Do you believe? Do you accept it as true? I heard something on the radio yesterday. I think it was yesterday or the day before. Talked about a check engine light. I don't know if y'all heard this story or not. But uh, when you're driving down the road, how many people have ever seen that little check engine light come on on your dash? And you ignore it. I mean, it's, it, the car sounds like it's running fine. I mean, it's not idling rough. It's not shaking real bad. Surely that's the mistake. But it doesn't go out. And what do we do? How many people have ever taken a piece of electrical tape and stuck it over the light to where you can't see the light no more? See, I, I can tell. All you, I can tell. There's some people out here that have ignored that warning light. I've ignored the warning light before. I'll just wait until it starts shaking or shimmying or something like that. You see, that, that little light, that system, is there as a pre-warning. Something's not right. A sensor's off. Maybe it ain't got enough oil in it. Maybe there's some trash in the fuel system, and it's not getting the full amount of fuel that it needs. It's there as a pre-warning so that you'll take it to the shop before it leaves you standing on the side of the road. I've been standing on the side of the road before. Because I've been one of them kind of people that puts that little piece of electrical tape over top of the light and says, I don't want to see that light no more. I've tried to find the ball of the, the fuse to pull the fuse out. But it's designed to save you heartache down the road. See, God gives us warning lights all throughout our walk. He'll turn the light on on your dashboard and he'll go to he'll flash that light saying warning the holy spirit's trying to get your attention to say don't go to that establishment don't don't hang out with that particular group of people sending these little warning lights and we know it we we hear it we hear it in our in our mind we can feel it in our heart God's speaking and he's warning and he's telling us, stay away from that place. Don't do that. Don't waste your time on that investment over there. You see, if we would start taking life a little bit different and start praying about the decisions that we make in life and say, God, do I need to make this investment? Look, I, I know there's preachers out there that preach against investing and they, they preach against the stock market and all that kind of stuff. And, and they say, oh, that's, that's like getting something for nothing no you're not you're actually putting money into something with expectation of return if i invest a thousand dollars in kodak i expect is kodak still a company if i invest a thousand dollars in kodak i expect a tenfold return and if i don't believe that i'm going to get a tenfold return i'm not going to invest that You know how many people refuse to invest in what God is doing, but yet they demand that God gives a return on their life? I'm not talking just financial. I'm talking about anything in life. God, I've got, and, and this is the simplicity of tithe, 10%, right? God, I've got a thousand, I don't know anybody that's got a thousand extra hours. God, I've got a thousand extra hours, and I should give a hundred hours of my time to you, but I'm only going to give 50. But we expect God to bless it. Do you believe? Do you believe even when it's not the way you want it or the way you expect it? This is where Zechariah was. This is where Zechariah was in Luke chapter 1 and verse 11. When the angel said, you're going to have a child. He says, how can I be sure that this would even happen? I'm going to tell you this story, and then I'm going to close so Josh can come whenever he's ready.
long before I ever accepted the, the pastorate here. And I say accept it because it had to be God. Just like the scripture says about giving, don't give out of necessity. Don't fulfill the role just because it's a vacant role. It had to be God. But God had started something a long, long, long time ago. In fact, it started in about 1997. When God started giving me visions of me being in the pulpit and preaching His Word. Long, long before I had ever gone to seminary, long before I had ever started doing any kind of teaching in Bible studies, I knew nothing about the Word of God. I knew nothing about the Word of God. But long before that time, God was making an investment in me. He was, he was teaching me. Little by little, He was planting seeds into my life. And let me just tell you something, that when God plants a seed in your life, He expects a return. There's not a farmer on this planet that will put a seed in the ground and walk away from it and not expect something to come back. That's foolish. So it would be foolishness to think that God would deposit something in your life and not expect a return on what He deposited. My favorite passage of Scripture, as most of you know, is Isaiah 55, 11. My word will not return to me void, but it will do exactly what I send it out to do. So every time I heard the word of God, I was sitting in chairs probably somewhere right about where you're at, Betty. That's an anointed area right there, by the way. You're a blessed man. But God was depositing into my life. God started showing me visions of me preaching the Word of God, being in the pulpit and preaching the Word of God. I didn't know what that meant. I had never told my wife this. I don't even think I've ever told her this. She came to me one day. And, well, actually, she didn't come to me. We were driving. We had left the church. Back then, we didn't have a little building. We would take the kids, the little kids, we would load them in our vans, and we would drive down to a little barbecue stand that's not there anymore, Mr. and Mrs. Green's place, right over on Jade Avenue. And we would have children's church, and then we would, we'd get done, we'd load up, we'd come back, and we would wait for dismissal. I praise God for the facility that we have. I praise God for the facility that we're going to have. Because this is just the beginning. But I didn't understand those visions because I wasn't what you would say is a learned person. I had just, I was just getting my feet wet. I was just studying scripture. I was just seeing what God was saying about me. And he started showing me these visions of preaching the word of God. I never said anything to my wife. But that one day we were driving. And we were right about where the goat roper was. That's, that's where the stop sign is at, what is that, 58? That's y'all's road. What is that, 58? 59? That's where the goat roper was. We were right about there. And she, you know what she said to me? She said, God told me you're going to preach the gospel. I kind of shook it off at first. I said, he did. He ain't told me that. I was lying because he really was but I was scared I was young I was the man it's my responsibility to take care of the family I have to I have to go to work I got to make sure there's food on the table I got to make sure at that time we had plenty of diapers and we had a lot of diapers I had three in diapers I was like, God, I don't know about all this preaching stuff. Fast forward a little bit, I decided to go to seminary. I said, well, if I'm going to be a preacher, I might as well learn how, right? So I go to cemetery school. And 
and I start learning. And I start learning these big words like hermeneutics, and I'm like, hey, look, I'm from Southeast Texas. You're going to have to talk in some real words, like just open up the word. You know what I did? I, I did about two and a half years, to, co close to three years. I dropped out before I got a degree. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm just going to sit under my pastor. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give as much as I can to getting as much as I can. And that's what I did. And so there were times when me and Charles would just sit one-on-one, -on -one, and he would be going through Scripture, and he would be explaining things to me and, and saying, this, this is what God is saying. And that's, that's kind of the format that I have followed into my preaching. I like to really explain it because that's, that's kind of how I was taught. You, you've got you to gotta make it in a way that I understand it. And so that's the way I try to portray my preaching. But, but you know what he said to me one day? Because I prayed with that man every day. Every Sunday morning before he came into the pulpit, I would go into his office and I would pray over him. And I would command the anointing of the Holy Spirit to set upon him that he would be the mouthpiece that God would use to send the Word of God out. You know what he told me one day? He said, Michael, I could see something was wrong. I could see in his countenance. And he said, Michael, I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm at the end of the road. And you're just now getting on the road. He said, I would have never. He said, I will argue with God. I never would have imagined that God would use you. I said, me neither. But when you're a willing vessel, it doesn't really matter what everybody else thinks about you. Do you believe that God has got something great for you? And when God speaks a word into you, are you willing to receive it? Even if it don't come in the form that you think it should come in. You see, God... Uh, Charles was, was talking to God and he was saying, God... Somebody needs to come in and take this thing. Somebody needs to come in and carry on what you started in this ministry. He said, I never would have thought it had been you. Words of encouragement. I felt great at that moment. I was not the prize choice, but you know who else wasn't? David wasn't the choice either. When the prophet Samuel came to anoint David to be king, David was not even allowed at the house. He said, boy, you stay out there with the, with the animals and you take care of them animals. I've got the prize of the family lineage standing right here in the house. One of these is going to be the anointed one. But when the prophet came to him and said, nope, he ain't the one. Nope, 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 nope. Are there any others? Well, yeah. There's this one, he's the kind of the runt of the litter, he's the youngest, he's, he's out there doing what I want him to do. Get him in here right now. And as soon as he stepped into the presence of the prophet, he said, God said, that's the one, anoint him. Let me tell you something, God is just looking for a willing vessel. Nobody thought that Jesus of Nazareth was who he was. I mean, there were a lot that did, but I'm just saying, he wasn't really accepted because he wasn't the, the kingly type. He wasn't the royal-looking person to do the job. But God will use those that everybody else thinks is no good. God will use the ones that everybody else says, no, there's no way. He don't have the education that he needs to be a preacher. Let me tell you something. All God wants is a willing vessel. And I'm asking you here today, are you a willing vessel? Are you willing to allow God to move in your life? Are you willing to let God speak into your life and you just say, yes, Lord, that's me.
Let's stand to our feet this morning. Father, I thank you for every person that's in this building today, every person hearing our voice. God, if you're speaking to just one person in this building today, God, I'm asking you to reveal yourself to them. God, I give you the praise, Father, for what you're continuing to do in this place. And we give you the authority, we give you place right now, God, to move mightily in this place. In Jesus' name. If you're in this building today and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, it is very simple to just accept Him. First, you have to recognize that you need a Savior. So I'm asking you today, if you're at that place in your life, we're going to be baptizing some people here in just a few minutes that made that decision, said, you know what, I've tried it my way, and my way didn't work. And they received Christ into their life. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you've been serving. Maybe you've been loving God your whole life, but you got away from Him. Something happened, and you got off of the path. You steered away. God said He'll accept you back. All we've got to do is come to Him. We're going to take a few moments. This altar is open. You do not have to be a member of New Covenant to come to this altar. This altar belongs to God. If you want to come and talk to Him, maybe you want to pray, maybe you want to ask Him into your life. Maybe you want to just say, God, I haven't been where I'm supposed to be, but I'm trusting You with my life. I'm giving You 100% right now. This is your opportunity. If you would like for me to pray with you, I would like the opportunity to pray with you, to pray over you, to stand in agreement with you. But this is your time. In Jesus' name.